So I'm Roger Burley. I'm the president of Southern Maine Conservation Collaborative, and uh, very pleased uh, to have uh, Maine Audubon host us tonight and, and this talk. It's a good location and certainly the, the right heritage for us to be here. So thanks to Maine Audubon, Eric Copper, and I think Bryce, where are you? Yep, there, thank you as well. Mm -hmm. Not sure who else is here from Maine Audubon, but whoever is, thank you. Um, also like to thank um, the Bangor Savings Bank Foundation um, for support for this project and for a lot of other work that we do at Southern Maine Conservation Collaborative. So SMCC is in its fifth year as a collaborative. We are the successor organization to the Portland North Land Trust Collaborative, which was three land trusts. Um, after five years, the Falmouth Land Trust decided to go off on its own. That left Oceanside Conservation Trust, which is mine, along with Shabi and Cumberland Land Trust, uh, Rod and Brian over there, and probably more of you. Um, and so we found that uh, with the year that we had, uh, the last year of Portland North Land Trust Collaborative, that uh, two things, that uh, two land trusts were probably not enough to support the, the fantastic staff that we have, Doreen and Jess over there. Uh, but we, more importantly, we realized all the good that had come out of our work for the three land trust, original land trusts. And this was just too good not to carry forward. So we held a meeting in January or whatever year it was, 2011, I think, and we had 56 people, probably a number of you uh, in this room, uh, came and uh, to, to hear what, what might uh, go f we might go forward with. And then uh, 23 organizations, 56 people at the Scarborough Library, and uh, so we decided that this was a good indication that this was support for what we're thinking about continuing. And then uh, in October of that year, uh, we held a meeting of potential funders. And we had really some terrific people come and express interest in, in hearing more about us and in, in offering their resources one way or another. So with that, we start off, I think it's probably January 12th, I think, yes. And so, um, hey Mars, come on out, you're out of seat. <laughs> so with that, um, we are uh, one quarter of the way through our uh, fifth year of SMCC, and um, we have had many successes, and we still have challenges, and we probably always will. So, uh, but one of the things that has been uh, the most fun for us is to hold events uh, of various sorts, and to basically uh, offer those resources which uh, are from outside ourselves. And so we have that going on tonight. Um, so. I will uh, finish up by reading our mission statement, uh, <clears throat> which is to accelerate conservation work in southern Maine by providing technical and administrative support and expanding meaningful partnerships. And just yesterday, we uh, voted uh, on uh, to accept our, uh, our board voted to accept our uh, latest vision statement and it's one we're going forward with. And so our vision is to strengthen organizations committed to protecting our environment. We know that together we can do more, and our purpose is to create and expand meaningful partnerships among conservation organizations. By sharing resources, our collective impact will lead to better conservation and healthier communities. So that's what we're up here. Eric Topper, you're up. Uh, my name is Eric Topper. I'm the Education Director here at Maine Audubon, and it's my honor and privilege to welcome you all here tonight. I know many of you have been here before. Uh, we, uh, one of the things I wanted to start with is we uh, at Maine Audubon just welcomed a new Executive Director on March 1st, Ula Admins Amundsen. Uh, it's not rolling off my tongue quite yet. I need more time for that, but uh, Ula's here. We're excited to have him. He was really disappointed that he couldn't be here tonight. He had a, a prior conflict that he couldn't get out of, and, and so was really excited that we were hosting it and, and wanted me to say hello and welcome you all on his behalf, and uh, he looks forward to meeting, I'm sure, every single one of you, literally. Uh, uh, Maine Audubon has been a member of Southern Maine Conservation Collaborative for about two years now, and I think it's fair to say that the collaborative, the original intent was, was primarily to support small, volunteer-led land trust with 
technical support and, and all sorts of other particular support, but I want to put a, a particular plug in and celebrate the benefit of SMCC for a, one of the larger organizations like Maine Audubon with a staff of 25 and, and lots of acreage and things like that, that we've also recognized the particular values of, of, of membership in an organization like this. First and foremost, these amazing technicians over here, uh, Jess and Dor Doreen, organizations both that are volunteer-led, that are tackling particular ongoing administrative tasks or projects like accreditation or acquisition benefit from that, but so do organizations with 25 largely specialists, right? There are still gaps and things that we need to take on and again, to have that resource of these two and all the wonderful interns and, and, and support network that comes with that has been invaluable to us even in two short years. Uh, the other big thing that we're excited about is this idea of kind of teaming up to bring some of the big thinkers, the innovators, the scholars, the leaders here that we can sort of share those learnings together. In the two years that we've participated, we've been involved in hosting Peter, or, uh, SMCC has hosted Peter Forbes here, we've hosted uh, uh, Rob Baldwin here, Jay tonight, these are big names in just two short years that independently we'd all be fumbling over to try to provide that resource for the community. So that's really exciting for us to have a part. Uh, and then lastly, just a part of this amazing network. I mean, look around this room. We have incredible, really, really smart, really committed, really passionate people. And these are the networks that we all need to deal with these, with these challenges that all of us are facing together and independently. So this is an incredible, we're, we're just really, it's, it's re, it, this is a really important part of our recent work is these collaborations and, and Southern Maine Collab Conservation Collaborative is a really important sort of delivery vehicle and network for us to be a part of and I, I definitely want to want to celebrate that a little bit and I know there are people here from from large organizations as well that are members as well so we, hopefully we can expand that network and really really celebrate those as well so uh, without am I you, okay so uh, the, the, so anyway I, uh, I'll bring up just Burton uh, to say more but welcome everyone thank you you well that was that was great um, both Eric and Roger just covered pretty much everything I was going to say, which is excellent in the way it should be. Um, but I want to echo the thank you for all of you attending. We have new friends and old friends, folks that we've been working with for almost 10 years now, and then new members to our organizations um, and partners of all kinds. So thanks for coming to this speaker. Jay. Uh, so I'm going to just say a few things about Jay. Um, Jay is the Sharp McNally Chair of Green and Socially Responsible Business at the College of the Atlantic in Bar Harbor and founder of its Vanguard Sustainable program, Business Program. The College of the Atlantic has been repeatedly cited as a leader in sustainability, as we know, and Jay's work has been featured in the New York Times, Fast Company, Fortune, Money, and dozens of others, and he has been a speaker at TEDx. Some of you may have seen the great video. Um, with, the, with experiences as an impact entrepreneur, academic, and strategy consultant to Fortune 100 companies, Jay's research focuses on merging sustainability, entrepreneurship, and strategy. To that end, Jay created the Abundance Cycle, an actionable model that builds on a venture's competitive strength and weaves in the latest tactics, tactics enterprises across the globe are using to maximize abundance for shareholders, the planet, and society. Jay also serves as a senior fellow in social innovation at Babson College and is a frequent speaker on sustainable innovation and enterprise. He has given talks to business and academics, academic groups in the United States as well as Japan, New Zealand, Australia, and the European Union. Prior to joining the College of the Atlantic, Jay was the Chief Operating Officer for O Naturals, a natural and organic fast food restaurant group, which many of us know because of the Falmouth O Naturals, Portland O Naturals, which we loved. Um, Jay has a wide range of work and life experiences. He has served in the Peace Corps in Mauritania, written an ecotourism business plan for a college in Costa Rica, broke fundraising records for Rails to Trails, Conservancy, counseled Native American students, and taught environmental education. Jay holds a BA from Colgate University and an MBA from Babson College. And when not ensconced in the abundance cycle, Jay enjoys cooking, hiking, 
in Acadia National Park and traveling with his wife Ursula and son Max. So I am very pleased and honored to introduce Jeff. Thank you so much for having me, Eric and Roger. Thank you for the introduction, Jess, and thank you for pulling all this together. This came together in somewhat um, record time. In some ways, well, every time I feel like I come back down to Portland from MDI, it's kind of like coming home, right? Um, you know, so we moved up to MDI about eight years ago. We definitely, and we, I remember spending time here with my son, Max, you know, when he was, you know, two years old and running around in here and checking out the, the discovery room and the other places. So it's, it's great to be back here. Um, so I intend to make you all work tonight. Are you all okay with that? Mm. All right, wait, what else are you going to say, right? Um, so so there's this, there is participation that is needed, or, or it'll be a very, very long night. And I can go out, I'm a professor now, been doing this for a few years, so I can go on for hours and hours. But if you participate, I'll keep it to a reasonable time frame. Does, does it sound fair? <laughs> All right, great. Um, so as I talked about, um, I, in many ways, I feel like I'm coming home. And just to give you some context, and we'll be talking a lot about context tonight, um, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about me and my background. So I grew up in central, central Pennsylvania, uh, in Harrisburg. Um, I was in the I was in the fifth grade uh, when. Some of you may be familiar with this, right? Uh, Three Mile Island. Uh, that happened when I was in, in fifth grade, and I remember uh, the mayhem that went on as a, as a result of that. Um, most recently, uh, and, and, and somewhat, I won't say a full loop, but I just came back from Japan uh, a little while ago, and I was down in uh, Fukushima and checking out what was going on there. And let me tell you, it is, uh, it is breath. Taking. And I remember with Three Mile Island, and you know, I, was, I took it from a perspective of a little kid, um, and you would hear stories about, um, you know, people evacuating and, you know, a week off of school, which we didn't actually think that was such a bad thing, right, when you're, when you're in fifth grade. Um, and to see that, and, and the disruption that happened, and then you go to Fukushima, and you see what has happened there, and you're driving through towns where across every single driveway, road, um, any entrance to a business, there is just a fence that they put up, so you can't stop. And and you can just see life was frozen. And you would go to the train, and you go to the train station, and there's bikes, just racks and racks of bikes, and signs on them that say, you know, do not touch. This, these are have not been decontaminated. And seeing miles and miles of uh, black bags that are like this and this high, with uh, dirt scraped into them, um, and that. You know, that are just kind of laying out in fields. It's just, it, it's absolutely breathtaking. So to see kind of the other side of this. So, so one of the things I think that was a formative experience for me was, was Three Mile Island. Also, I loved and still love to go camping. And, you know, in the summers we go travel, Max and Ursula and I, and enjoy the beautiful places in Maine and elsewhere in the world. Um, and when I was in college, um, I was very much, and I, and I think I still am, but just in a different way, I'm, I was very much an activist and worked for the PERGs, for those of you who are familiar with that, work with Pennsylvania Wildlife Federation, um, canvassing and going door to door and talking about things like toxic use reduction. Um, so, so how in the world did I end up in business, right? Um, and for me, it was really Peace Corps. And this is a picture from Mauritania. Um, you know, Mauritania is in the Sahara Desert. Um, it is a land of extremes. So in the hot season, it goes up to 145 degrees. And, um, and you always, you know, the way we would describe it is you always knew how you felt when you were there because it was so extreme. Um, in Mauritania, they abolished slavery in 1980. 1980, not 1880, right? 1980. Um, and so when I was there in the early 90s, there were still villages, and this is a pretty typical looking village. Uh, there were still villages where you had this kind of indentured servitude and slavery going on. And to me, you know, that's really the, one of the ultimate evils of business, right? You are enslaving people um, and taking profit from their work. Um, but on the other hand, though, you had women and groups of women who would get together in these cooperatives. Um, and you would see by having a business, suddenly they could um, earn money and improve their family's nutrition, uh, health care, provide education, uh, their social standing would improve. And you would see from that the, the positive sides of enterprise um, in that you could really, they could change their whole lives and the way they lived and improved both their station 
and, and their families' lives by, by having an enterprise. Now, the other thing I, I realized when I was in the Peace Corps was that business is everywhere. Right? It affects every single thing you do, the, the furniture you're sitting on, the rugs in this room, everything come, is related to business in one way or another. And as someone who is an activist and really interested in changing people's lives, what I realized, if you really want to bring about change, probably the biggest lever you can pull on in the world is business. Because it is so, it, it's the most ubiquitous activity on the planet. So as I was saying, so we'll, we'll dive some more into this, but as I was saying, context is really important. And so I, I want to just spend a moment here uh, talking to you about surfing. <laughs> All right? So, so this is a, a person, you know, I think it's a man, he's about you know, five, six feet tall, and he's out surfing. And now context really matters and changes things. So, you know, not only is he surfing, he's surfing right here, <laughs> right? So this is a hundred foot wave, okay? So the wave is eight to 10 stories tall. Um, if you don't surf correctly on this kind of wave, you're, it's pretty much a death sentence. And what happened was, you know, in surfing, you have to you understand, you know, the waves are coming in, they're constantly crashing on the shore, and there's a pretty predictable pattern to how a wave forms. But when you're surfing something like this, and by the way, these were considered to be unrideable until not that long ago. Um, and when the context changes and you try to surf like this, you not only need to understand the wave, you need to understand what's happening in the weather, you're traveling all over the world to try and find these, you're looking at uh, undersea formations, um, looking at what's happening onshore and offshore. And what happened when you try to surf something like this, as the context changed, uh, they invented all kinds of new technologies. So now there's tow riding, where you actually are towed into this wave and you're dropped in so you're going fast enough that you can ride it. Different kinds of rescue, new equipment was invented. And the context is constantly changing, even though you have this, this, this churning. Now, the economy is a lot like this. The context is continually changing. And so in 1896, if you look at the Dow Jones Industrial Average, right, which catalogs the major companies in the country, it was really about, in 1896, it was about ag and commodities. And here are, the you know, here are the companies that were listed on the Dow at that time, the American cotton oil, sugar, tobacco, gas, uh, national lead, right? The railroads were coming on, but, but fundamentally, it's ag and, um, ag and commodities. And now, if you look, and using Bar Harbor as kind of a sample or a test case, these, this context, you know, if you look at Bar Harbor back in that time, it was this ag commodity-oriented place, right? As was, you know, most of Maine at the time. Um, and then, so even in a little teeny town like Bar Harbor, the context of the economy is affecting what is going on. Now, if we fast forward here and go to um, the 1920s, you see that retailing and manufacturing and radio are all emergent. So you have things like uh, Sears and Roebuck, uh, the Radio Corporation, Nash Motors, um, et cetera. And you can see these Bethlehem Steel, right? These were companies that people, when I came from central Pennsylvania, right, there's towns near me called Steelton, right, where you could go and see a steel plant that's three miles long. And much like, you know, the industry in Maine, people said this would never, these will never go out of business, right? Because it's so sure that this will never change. And again, going looking up in Bar Harbor area, you know, you got a Nash dealership <laughs> up that way. Um, and then if we fast forward again, you know, to 2016, it's really about knowledge and service industries, right? And so the whole context of the economy has shifted. And so you have Nike and Pfizer and McDonald's and Apple, Boeing, um, Exxon Mobil, Dupont. Um, but really a lot of knowledge and service industries at the heart. And again, if we go to MDI, what do we have? You've got tourism, right, service industry, and we have knowledge industry with JAX, MDIBL, College of the Atlantic, and our, those are the fundamentals of our economy. So again, this, this context that's all around us is constantly changing. So if you're a company, what you're thinking about is, um, is what is next? And what is happening is, if you look at the turnover in the thousand biggest companies, in the 70, from 70s to 80s, about 35% of those companies turned over. If you go a, a decade later, it's 45%. And this continues up to the 2003 to 2013, and 10-year period, 
70% of those companies have turned over. Turned okay. over and died? They're, they're gone, so they've been replaced by other companies. So, so what is happening is the economy is changing and it's happening faster and faster and faster and faster. Okay, so is everyone with me on that? Right, so, so you not only have change from all these different things, the context is shifting, but so is this rate of what they call creative destruction. So companies are constantly turning faster and faster and faster. And so what you want to know, at, know if you're a company, you're asking, what is next? Right, it's not what we're doing now, but where are we going that is important? How is the context changing? And so does anyone, there's only one company that was on the Dow in 1896 that's still around today. GE. And it's GE, right? And so if you look, and here's what it, what it looks like, you can see here how many people have survived all these different contexts. So American Tobacco made it one, GE made it through two, Standard Oil changing to Exxon has gone through a couple. But so these companies are all wondering what is next? And the context has changed. So the new context that's coming around is, is explained by this simple graph, right? Um, so the first time I saw this, it, it, my, it hurt my head. Um, so what we have here, I'll try to go through it, is down here along the bottom is you have the UN Human Development Index. Um, and that is basically, are we living, you know, are we living educated lives, a low infant mortality, um, all the things that you want, um, you know, when you're, when you're living and, and, you're, and you're feeling like you have, have a good life. So you've got enough food, you've got good education, good health care, etc. And so, in, according to the UN, you want to be uh, between 0.8 and 1.0. Um, over here, this is the ecological footprint, or the number of hectares per person, uh, the biocapacity of the planet. Okay, so in 1961, this little dotted line here, we had about 4 hectares per person. In 2006, we had about two. Now, as our population goes up, for those of you who are mathy people, right, that box keeps shrinking. And so where you want to be is you want to have high human development right over here, and this is within the Earth's limits. Hmm. Right? So, so, and what all those little dots are, those are countries. Right? So the blue countries um, here are the European countries. And the North American countries here are green. You know, so you can see if everyone was living like us, you're talking, we only need four or five planets worth of resources, right? Um, and so what you quickly realize is the new thing that is constraining economic growth is rapidly becoming the biocapacity per person. Um, and so because of that, it's starting to change the way, uh, the way people are thinking about their enterprises. Now, this graph, just to give you a sense of that, was put out in the Vision 2050 report by the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. So this was put out by large companies who are looking at what is the future going to look like. And if you read the headline, you know, it's meeting human demands within the ecological limits of the planet. And so companies are starting to think about this, and they're all, and people are, the smart ones are racing to figure out how do you get into this blue box here. Because they know, ultimately, destroying the planet it is a really bad business decision, right? You are not, if the planet is wrecked, the economy is a subset of the environment. Um, and so this context is changing. And so, um, all right, so here's where I'm going to need you to, to work with me for a minute. And, and when you start looking at things in this new context, you start coming up with new ideas, all right? Um, and so we're going to do a little exercise here to, to try and see how can we deal with some of these things. So, all right, so you're going to have the decision whether you can abandon or start a real industry that exists today uh, that has the con that's had the following consequences after it's been in existence roughly 100 years, okay? So let me say, don't mention the industry. Someone will absolutely know what this is and they're going to want to say, don't say it. Everyone got me? Okay. There's always a spoiler out there. All right. So, uh, Cindy, you're going to be, if you're running this industry, you're going to be killing a million wild animals per week. Uh, you're going to be killing, you know, deer, elk, birds, frogs, and uh, tens of thousands of domestic pets. Congratulations. Yeah. Lucas, uh, you're going to be causing spectacular increases in emphysema as well as heart disease and uh, bronchial, bronchial infections. 
Um, congratulations. Um, and Roger, you'll be emitting a quarter of the U.S. greenhouse gases, uh, threatening global climactic stability. Um, and Jody, you'll be uh, creating seven billion pounds of unrecycled scrap every year. Um, and, and then Betsy, um, sorry, uh, you'll be causing the U.S. to spend between 60 and 100 million dollars a year in an increasingly hostile region and can cause us to maintain continual war readiness. Um, and finally, uh, Mike, since you knew about GE, um, you'll be requiring the public to spend about 200 million dollars a day to maintain the infrastructure to support this industry. So, who wants to start this industry? Nobody? The one percent. The one, the one percent? <laughs> All right. So, if you knew about this industry, would you use their, would you use the product? No. Or go, go ahead. We're all using the product. We're all using the. Are we are all using the product? What would? Let me ask you. What would cause you to use the product? Coming to a talk. All right, coming to a talk, <laughs> Mike. Very well. All right. What What else though? What would What would make it okay? What would make all of this okay for you? Convenient. All right. Surv survival. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Need. Someone said convenient. Life the way we know it. All right. Life the way we know it. So that's worth, you know, killing a million wild animals per week, maybe? Yeah, what else? What else would make, make you do this? Hunger. All right, a cultural norm, just something you don't think about, don't question. Sorry? Hunger. Hunger, yeah, that, that could do it. Short-term things, what you see versus what you see in front of you every day versus, you know, what you have to go a little further away from home to pay attention to. All right. Well, let me give you the, let me give you the other side of the coin here. Um, I'll, first, I have to mention that you'll also be maiming or injuring uh, 250 million people and killing more people that have died in all wars in U.S. history. It's a little <laughs> icing on a cake there. Every year? Um, no, I think that, that's total. I think you're talking about the government. Well, hang, hang on, don't say it if I said it. I said, don't, don't say it if you know it. Um, so the other side of the coin here, again, don't mention the industry, is you're going to employ millions of people. Okay, you're going to employ millions of people in gainful work. Uh, you're going to sell a copy of your product every two seconds. So you just sold one, right? You just sold another. If you're a business person, right, you're psyched, you're selling a lot of product. Um, you're going to provide consumers with undreamed of levels of personal mobility. And you're going to revolutionize pretty much every aspect of society from agriculture, urban planning, manufacturing, family vacation in the built environment, to name a few. You'll also solve a massive solid waste problem in urban areas. Uh, and um, and if, the, if the sales from the five largest companies were put together and they were our country's GDP, you'd be the 20th largest economy on the planet. Right, so you'd be in the G20. So, um, does that change anybody's mind? All right, well, so who can tell me what is the industry? Yeah, it's the automobile industry, right? Is that so, killing, killing ant animals? Well, driving cars and collisions on roads is killing ant animals. I mean, they're not directly going on. Cars are causing those deaths, yeah. Um, so, so, why do we drive cars? Convenience. All right, you have can ignorance of all the things you've just shown us. So everyone will be walking home, right? So, so you have convenience. <laughs> all right, so convenience. But really, why, why do we use cars? Why do we buy them? Or why do other people buy them? We don't even say ourselves. It's our livelihood. All right, livelihood, because you need to get around to get to work. Convenience. All right, convenience. Why else? There's no alternative. All right, there's no alternative out there. Great. Why else? In some places. Yeah, some places that's true. But why else do we drive? Why else do people buy cars? Everybody has fun. All right, fun. Status. Status. What were you going to say? Just fun. Yeah, fun. Great. Yeah, I would suggest we don't know the consequences. Yeah, the, for some people certainly that you don't know the consequences, so you don't do it. Why? Why else? Do, this is a pretty good list. One more. People figure that 
me changing isn't going to solve the problem. If everybody else is doing it, why should I inconvenience myself and stop? Okay, so it's not worth, there's like a hassle factor in there, right? So, so what if, um, so the question becomes here, and, and this is where you're starting to like, we're starting to get into the piece around abundance is, how do you change the industry? How do you change automobiles? What could you do to give people what they want? So the fun, the convenience, the, um, the status, the, um, you know, be able to get to work, um, be able to still interact. How do you give them people what they want, but how do you reduce the negative impacts? What kinds of things, how would you redesign this industry? Because let's face it, when the auto industry started, people weren't thinking 100 years down the road, right? I mean, you know, they, they were talking about this strange thing called the horseless carriage, right? There were entrepreneurs who were starting this, and they were just worried about keeping their doors open. And there was all this legislation about cars backfiring, and they were being beaten by horses and races. And, you know, it was this odd little thing. No one would have ever said, like, okay, here's all the things it's going to lead to. But so the question is, we're here today, we understand the impacts. How would we change this around? What could we do to lessen some of those impacts, but still give people the kinds of things they're looking for? Well, they're sort of working on that now, with the uh, self-driving car. Uh, all right, so you could have- All right, so you could have automation, a self-driving car, yep, what else? Solar power, public mm -hmm. transportation. All right, solar power, either for a car or for public transportation. Get away from oil. All right, get away from oil, find new fuel sources. Collective ownership. I'm sorry? Collective ownership. Collective ownership, like uh, either peer-to-peer -peer sharing or, or a company that has a sharing program. To restructure our, our communities in a way that we don't have to make the kind of traveling that we've had to do for all of our basic needs and for work and for other things so that everything's in closer proximity. Okay, so you have restructuring communities and figuring out how you can make it more walkable, livable, bikeable, etc. What else? Give everybody a smartphone. On a bus. All right, give everybody a smartphone and stick them on a Wi-Fi bus, great. Other <laughs> ideas. Right, that's a, so you're, get, you're getting the idea. So let me show you. It also, the one thing to think about now, we're talking about the five largest companies here are you know, equal to the 20th largest economy on the planet. So these are very large, extremely powerful companies. But yet there's a ton of change happening out there. So just like the Bethlehem steel of the old days, there, there are things that are afoot that are, that are changing. And people are trying to figure out and answer the quest, many of the things that you, you're putting out there. So here are a few alternatives. So this is an electric motorcycle um, that was put out, so using a different power source, much more efficient. Um, there are these, um, you talked about self-driving cars, there are these programmable pods in some places where you can get in and program where you want to go and it will take you there. Either these were on a rail system, but there's also other ones that are, that are free driving. Um, this is a compressed air car put out by Tata Motors um, that was running on, on that. Uh, this is a crowd design car uh, from Fiat, the Fiat Mio. Um, you also have public transportation, so things like the bullet train in Japan um, and, and in Europe. You have companies like Zipcar, where you have car sharing that are out there, and every time a zip car goes onto the road, several other cars leave the road, and they found that people increase their uh, likelihood to use public transportation, um, to shop locally, um, and so it's re and, and it reduces congestion. Um, you also have the opportunity of using solar power, um, and a lot of people don't know this, there's a movement out there around vehicle to grid, right? And so if you look at, what does your car do all day? Yeah, it's just sitting there. Right? And if you, if you looked at all the energy stored in all the car batteries, there's actually more energy in there than we're producing on the whole grid. And so you <laughs> can tap into those car batteries and then re also be recharging them using renewables. Um, this is a really efficient truck that was designed by Walmart to help improve gas mileage. This is a bike highway that's recently been approved in London. Um, right? So totally enclosed to make it much more accessible for biking and keep it separate from cars. This is a public-private partnership uh, that's happening in Portland, Oregon to bring streetcars back out and improve public transportation. Uh, Relay Rides is a peer-to-peer -peer sharing network, so you, you can rent your own car out to your peers. Um, you have, this is a totally sustainably designed car that runs on hydrogen fuel inside parts are recyclable. 
um, using different materials. This is a, a, from New Zealand, it's called a yike bike, um, and they go higher speeds, like 15 to 20 miles an hour, and you ride on top of them, but they're also foldable, so you can carry them upstairs into your apartment. Uh, of course, Tesla, everybody has heard about. If you want to think about opportunities, Tesla just, when they announced their brand new car, they promptly raised well over a billion dollars from customers putting in pre-orders. So talk about finding opportunity. Um, this is actually a former student of mine, Nick Harris, who is uh, making butanol, which is a drop-in substitute for gasoline, out of food waste. Um, he's getting his PhD working on that, that now. Uh, this was a car, this is a car that gets about 200 miles per gallon. Uh, designed by, ironically, given what's going on, by Volkswagen. Um, and this is the Toyota iRoad. And the idea behind this is you take your public transportation to a, a place and then you hop in one of these little three-wheeled motorcycles and it takes you the last mile so you can still get to work. And then finally you have programs like bike share programs that are sponsored by you know, Citigroup and others. So there is a lot, a lot of change going on out there. And if we take a moment and zoom back out where we've been, is you have um, all of these stages of the economy, right? And every time you go through one of these new stages, you have these periods of chaos. And the last one, for those of you who remember when we went through the information age, do you remember the early days of the information age, right? Dial up, you know, beep, beep, and all that stuff. And, and there were, when, I remember when it was happening, and I was, in a, I was actually at Rails to Trails Conservancy at the time. And, and everyone's saying, what is this thing? You know, do we have to pay attention to it? It's slow, it doesn't work. And now imagine if 15 or 20 years now later, if you would have just assumed the internet was a fad, how different would your, or, would your organization, and, I, when, and when I say business, I'm talking business or nonprofit, would your organization or enterprise even exist today um, if you had entirely missed the internet age, right? And so we're entering a new age right now um, because of these constraints, and this, it's this age of what I call abundance, um, what a lot of people call sustainability, and the idea here is that you have to operate um, and be able to produce um, outstanding environmental, physical, as well as social results. And if you're not doing that, and that is what is coming down the pike, you are going to be replaced. And, and so what the idea here is, it's not about having just getting by, or you know, a lot of times the, and sustainability is an incredible concept. It's become fraught as it's become really popular. Right? And so people have just associated with like, I'm sustainable, I take a shorter shower and I suffer appropriately. Right? And that's not what this is about. This is about finding new opportunities and, and figuring out ways that you can move forward. Um, and so in the old model, um, you know, this is what happens. And, and this is what happens going forward. And, and a lot of times you have this for-profit, non-profit divide, right? And the non-profits, in some sense, they get to be the punishers. Right, you tell everyone it's it's like these things are horrible that you're doing, and so you have a case like Volkswagen, right? Um, and Volkswagen, when they reported on their emissions cheating, this is a chart of their stock. Their value went down by 45 percent, right? And so you see how companies that are ignoring this I, these ideas of abundance are being punished for this on the one hand, um, and that partially happens because. Today, about 80% of stock value is based on what they call intangible assets. And intangible assets are brand, reputation, stakeholder, engagement, uh, strategy, business model, those kinds of things, not on owning large factories where you make stuff. Right? And so when, Volks, when they found out Volkswagen was cheating on the emissions, you can see directly correlated just how much they suffered. And they went from being a company, you know, kind of moving up here and looking at opportunity to, potential to one that was really exposed to risk down here. But in a way, you know, punishing is one part of it, right? That's your stick. But there's a much bigger carrot out there. Um, and so the idea behind abundance is we're trying to define what are companies and enterprises looking for. And so on the people side, what you're really talking about are some concrete goals. You're looking at improving the workplace, building community, and solving social issues. Um, on the planet side, what you're looking at is how do we reduce waste, use waste as a resource, or build natural capital, you know, similar to an organic farmer. Right? How, do you take, how do you put back more than you take out? And then when you do these things right, from the business side, um, what you have is you are reducing risk, 
right? That's that Volkswagen being punished. But for any company, what you're thinking about is how do I cut costs? How do I grow sales? And you can create this virtuous cycle, putting all these things together. And so that when the company, by growing, it's doing good out there in the world and it's helping solve problems. And it's not an either or dichotomy, right? You, you, you're helping them realize where are the new opportunities that you can do this. And for most companies, they desperately need this outside perspective, which everyone in this room can provide because you understand where the problems are, which is also probably where the opportunities lie. <coughs> now, as I said, this is about redefining pathways and really looking for new solutions. So if we were talking about alternative transportation in a city, right, this is one example of what you could do. So this is New York. That's theoretically, you know, you can theoretically ride your bike right here. Um, you know, it's um, kind of a death wish. Um, and, you know, I think, and as, you know, I have a 10-year-old now, so, you know, that's something I might have done in my 20s, but I'm certainly not doing that today. Um, but what you're looking for is not the, the least common denominator, but how do you redefine the very pathways that we're talking about and really maximize impact? And so the example that we had before of this bike highway from London, right, where people have really reimagined, not just saying we need a lane for bicyclists, but how do we make it so people can really be in the city on their bikes and have it be an experience where someone doesn't want a car at all and they can be on their bike. Um, and so what is happening here in a huge gap that you see, excuse me, with uh, sustainability is there, and, and uh, businesses and nonprofits is there is this language gap, right? So if someone's talking about carbon emissions and you know, not polluting, and a business person may be worried about innovation and thinking about new opportunity. And so what, what people are starting to realize that if you can bridge this language gap, there is tremendous opportunity out here. So this is a 2009 issue of the Harvard Business Review, right, where they talk about um, how sustainability is now the key driver of innovation. Now, Harvard Business Review is not, um, you know, not exactly you know, holding up the banner for green and sustainable. But even they're recognizing that, um, you know, and, and the authors of this article were talking about how sustainability is the mother load of organizational and technological innovations that yield bottom line and top line returns. Now to a business person, that's, that's something to think about. And you, and you saw all those new opportunities that happened within the auto industry. Now, when you look at what is happening out there and for the companies that are embracing this, what they're finding is for a business, you want to have these competitive advantages. You're looking at ways um, to, to find new opportunity. And all of the things up here that you see that are as a result of embracing this abundant perspective are things businesses want to do every day. Um, so everything from restructuring costs to customer loyalty to having uh, employees that are more loyal. Um, to understanding unique competencies. And if you reduce waste, which a lot of this is where it starts, is reducing waste, essentially you're reducing costs, right? So as you embrace this abundant perspective, there's lots of business benefits. And what you're seeing, um, this is a, and you're seeing the real results out in the stock market. And so here are the returns for the Standard & Poor's 500 over a 10 year period. So essentially it doubled. If you look at that, these firms of endearment here went up by 16 times. Now, what these firms are, um, these are ones that uh, who value stakeholders. And much like you all have stakeholders for your various organizations, right? when you think about stakeholders in the business sense, you're talking about the people who work for you, you're talking about your suppliers, um, you could be looking at the environment. And so they're saying that firms that actually look at the broader perspective are outperforming their competitors. And so here's an example of, of who these people are. Are these good guys or some good and some bad? I'm sorry, I don't get Yeah, well, I mean, so, so these are companies that are, what they're doing is they're looking beyond just saying, we're, the traditional mantra in business is you want to just maximize profit, right? And what these folks are saying is, well, we're actually interested in looking at how are we treating our people? Um, how are we dealing with our suppliers? Um, what are we doing for the environment? 
Um, These and, are all good guys. Well, I mean, you know, it gets more complicated, right? Nothing. It's not quite good and bad because I think everyone probably everyone nobody's perfect. So these, I would say, are people who are trying and doing some good stuff, but undoubtedly they can improve, just like we all can, right? But, the, but they're doing some pretty amazing things. <laughs> so the question that I oftentimes hear is like, okay, all this sounds great theoretically, but where do I start with this? How do I actually move the needle? And if you look, um, there is a set of tactics that companies like these and others are using that are proven out there in the world. And as we were looking at the auto industry before, um, you see this one up here, waste is food. So how do you take something that, was, that you were just throwing it out before, and how do you make that into a productive resource? And so the vehicle to grid that we were talking about is taking you know, sunlight, turning that into energy, and, and doing that. The sharing economy, we talked about relay rods, right? So peer-to-peer -peer sharing is another way people are doing this. Using less, radical resource productivity is what they call it. But how do you do more with less? How do you find out, what am I wasting? Right? Every time you're wasting something, that's something you're producing that you really don't need to be producing. Right? So you can cut that out and save costs and find new opportunities. Building natural capital, we talked about with the organic farmers. Biomimicry. Right? How do you, nature has been dealing with an inordinate number of issues um, you know, since the beginning of time. And so looking at nature to see how they have solved problems. And so companies are looking like the hummingbird's beak here is what the, is what the front of the bullet train is based on. You know, and today they're designing wind turbine blades based on, how, on whale fins and how they pass through water. Uh, looking at how do you solve problems and not sell it. Instead of selling a product, I'm going to solve your problem. Right? So Zipcar solves a transportation problem rather than sell, selling you a car. And you know, now you have Ford talking about we're not going to be selling you a car you know, out there in the future. We're going to be providing you with a transportation solution. Um, unbundling, looking, breaking apart the industry and looking at what is the little thing we can do in a very specific area. Instead of providing the solutions for everybody, look at something very specific, like the Toyota iRoad. Um, on micro enterprise, you see these changes. This company here is called Clean Engines. They work in the Philippines. And what they've simply done is they have all these two-stroke motorcycle engines that are really highly, highly polluting, and they've converted those to four-stroke engines and, and figured out ways to make them less polluting so they run more efficiently for the people uh, who own them. Um, the, the compressed air car that I showed you was a vehicle that was originally designed for, uh, for the Indian market, so people who are, uh, had much lower uh, levels of income could still afford this new kind of transportation that runs on air. Um, looking at people crowding and looking at people for ideas or money to find solutions. And there's been tons and tons of examples of that. Coming up with new entities. So now there are B corporations, low profit limited liability companies, and all these kinds of corporate forms that align people's values with their legal structure. Um, the service profit chain is being used by companies like Tesla. And this is an incredibly complicated uh, business uh, tactic which says, all right, this is going to just amaze you. Are you ready? So it says, if you treat your people well and teach them what the customer wants so they can exceed customer expectations, your customers are going to be happy and they're going to come back to you. And in turn, that's going to help grow your company. Right? Incredible. Right? Like, totally shocking. <laughs> um, so, you know, and this is being used by companies like Whole Foods and Trader Joe's and other people who are leaders in their industry. Um, and so you have regenerative marketing. This one is new and, and just kind of coming onto the scene where you start to say, how can we use our marketing dollars um, to actually be regenerated? And so here you have a bank who's sponsoring um, you know, the bike sharing. And what can we do with our marketing dollars so we put them out there in the world and still use them to get our name out there, but use it to solve social or environmental problems and raise awareness in that way um, and really get creative. Collaborative exchange is another thing that's going on um, where people are looking at alternative currencies or using time as currency and exchanging hours of work. Um, and so like in the, in the Berkshires, they, their currency is called Berkshires. And so you can use your Berk Berk shares to go like pay for a taxi or other transportation or whatever you need. And then finally looking at impact investing. And where you see is 
Um, companies like Honda and Toyota are starting to look at not only selling you a car, excuse me, not only selling you a car, but looking at how your whole house could be a battery. And you could come home and use your house to then charge your electric car that's in your garage, um, you know, with this, through the solar panels and other things. And lots of companies are investing in, in these different things. And finally, there's also opportunities to think about your own tactics. Now, um, and I, I want to, so we're going to, I just want to talk about the abundance cycle for a moment here, and then, and then we're going to loop back to what does this mean for all of you. But I just wanted folks to see that, you know, this idea of abundance, it's, it, you can help and be part and parcel of creating a better world. So for businesses, and actually for all of your uh, entities that you operate, all the nonprofit, for profit, doesn't matter. There's there are these this discrete set of activities that happens. So and I'll go through them very briefly. So inbound, you bring stuff in. If you think about all the materials and things you bring into your office every day, in operations, the next one here, you convert that into other things. Uh, then you distribute it. In outbound, you have marketing, which you're all very familiar with, and then you have uh, service. You know the service that you provide after a sale or after someone has joined your organization. And then finally, what we've done here is we've added in this thing called unsold production, traditionally called waste. So everything that you throw out is stuff you are producing, but you are not selling, right? Which is a really bad business proposition. If you think about your offices, everything that you're producing in that office that <coughs> isn't being put to a good use is really unsold production. And so what you do is, with every enterprise, for-profit or non-profit, you can apply that abundant perspective to that and start to say, where are new opportunities and things that we haven't thought of before? And so I just want to go through this quick five-step process. So if you were working with or collaborating with someone or thinking about this yourself, um, you would really be looking at doing a couple of things. With, with the abundance cycle, thinking about what is the purpose of the organization? Why does it exist? All businesses and all entities were founded to solve a problem, help people do something. Um, and so what is the purpose of what they originally set out to do? Um, and get back in touch with that. Figure out which part of this cycle, where are their competitive strengths? Like everybody does something a little bit better, right? So you have companies like Zipcar, who we've talked about, you know, they're really focused on the outbound distribution of cars around the city. Um, in your organizations, whether you're doing advocacy or buying land or depending on what you're doing, you probably have an area of strength here, um, either bringing in resources to make a purchase or being in touch with a big membership base and think about you know, what are your areas of strength. So you can then look at those areas where you're strongest and start playing with those tactics that we brought up there and saying, well, what would happen if we tried this new tactic here? And you can iterate different solutions. Um, and then where, where things oftentimes break down is this communication piece, right? Where I'm trying to talk to you in my language and you're speaking another language because you're in operations and I'm in marketing or you're an environmental advocate and I'm a chief, oper or a chief financial officer. So you're talking about carbon and I'm talking about dollars. So you've got to really work hard to bridge this communication gap. And this is, and especially, you know, where you've had traditionally nonprofits and for-profits oftentimes were in adversarial roles. And say, wait, what can we do together versus how can we be against each other? How can I help you discover a new opportunity versus, you know, not, versus just telling you what you're doing wrong? And then finally, you know, you've got to measure, report, and repeat this. Um, and now Jason Clay, who's the senior vice president of World Wildlife Federation, has done a lot of work with companies. I think what he talks about here. It is really important, this notion that sustainability has got to be something that we all care about. That the groups, you need to have the collaboration, even if you've never had it before. Um, and we really do need to manage this planet as if our life depended on it, because it does. Right? And so it is not good enough for everyone just to stay in their separate silos and say, okay, this is what we're doing over here, and you do your thing over there, and occasionally we'll bash heads, or, or maybe we won't interact at all. But, you know, this is going to take the efforts of everybody if we're going to, you know, we started with that little blue box right over there in the corner. And, you know, if we're going to get things down to that, it's going to take all of us working together and, and coming up with new solutions and not just saying, like, you did that wrong, you need to do it differently. 
Um, and so what is starting to happen is you've got uh, people are coming together to collaborate. And they're doing exactly what we talked about in looking, moving from just saying like this is a bad thing and this is a risk to finding these new sources of value. And so this was a, a piece that was put together for a private equity firm that, that buys out companies. And they started to say, what happens if we don't just look at environmental risk and look at risk mitigation, but what if we look at finding opportunities over here? What would that look like? And the unlikely players who teamed up to make this uh, were the Carlisle Group and Environmental Defense Fund. Right? And they're working together to figure out how can, they, how can this be mutually beneficial. And the Carlisle Group for those of you who don't know, is you know, one of the largest private equity firms on the planet. Um, an environmental defense fund I'm sure you're all very familiar with. Um, you know, and they've been doing a lot of really uh, good work in this area. And so if you're interested in starting to collaborate and come up with these new solutions, uh, there's a couple of uh, best practices that are out there. So um, first, this piece of language, right? You've got to You've really got to sit down and try to get that together because, you know, if you've ever spoken, if you've ever traveled or been to a foreign country, right, that's, that's what this is like. You've got to figure out how people speak the language and, and use that so you can get aligned. Um, the, the attitude to take with this is generally that, you, you, yes, you're going to have some goals, but there's got to be a good deal of flexibility because just like in a startup company, you know, sometimes you think you're going this way and then suddenly the road terms. Um, and, and you want to make this timely and put it on, on bounds around it um, so you, you know where you're going and you know how long it's going to last and it just doesn't hang out there forever. Um, you know, oftentimes um, the, the folks who are talking about this, and there's a, there's a great article on this in uh, the MIT Sloan Management Review where they just did a report with Boston Consulting Group on collaboration and that's where I'm pulling these out of. Uh, they talk about having the board be engaged, um, you know, on both levels. So the leadership, it's not, it, it's great if you have engagement at other levels, but you also need to engage at the top level so you really have the commitment. Um, and thinking about this is what, how do you enter this? And more importantly, like how do you break up when it's done, right? So you have a good entrance, a good engagement, and then understand what happens at the end of this. Where do we go when we're finished working together? And, you know, what is, what is that going to look like? Um, and of course you want to do due diligence on the organizations on both sides and be really clear about what are the resources you're committing to this, what are they committing to this, what is joint, you know, what, what is not and what is independent. Um, and you know, I'd say lastly, this, the people piece is so key and they talk about you have to have teams that are going to be willing to trust each other and are going to want to work together and so it's got to be a coalition of the willing, if you will. Now, so we've been talking about this in terms of the auto industry and isolated business cases. Um, I wanted to just briefly mention uh, this place right here. So this is a picture from Samso Denmark. Um, if you want to see what the power of a collaboration between business, nonprofit, community can look like and where it can go, this is a great example. I was there um, the fall before last with a group of students and with a group of people from the outer main islands. Um, and the main islands, as you may know, have some of the highest energy costs uh, in the country. And so we were going to Samso because this is a carbon negative island. So it's about half the population and size of Mount Desert Island. Um, and they were arguably the first carbon negative community in the world. And so on Samso, they produce more renewable energy uh, than they consume. They have restructured their entire um, they have district heating plants where they're burning local agricultural waste, stuff that just used to be sitting there rotting in the fields, and they're now bringing it in and using that to heat homes and putting more money into millions of dollars into the local economy rather than sending it abroad. Um, but this partnership would not have happened uh, without uh, nonprofit organizations engaging with the community and then also engaging with businesses. So, for example, um, these are the onshore wind turbines here, but they have 10 offshore wind turbines. Those turbines, some of them own, some, a few of them are owned privately by you know, groups of small investors, but the majority of them are cooperatively owned, where people own a share or two in them. And the way they were able to make that work is the banks, the local banks were willing to loan people money 
um, to buy a share of that wind turbine because the banks understood it. They knew exactly how much energy those turbines were going to generate after the studies. And, so, and they knew what the power and the energy was worth. So they could make a long-term loan because they understood you know, what the returns would be on that investment. And so the local banks enabled local people to buy shares in these wind turbines to help, you know, again, create this kind of abundance. And for them, this has been a real uh, piece of economic renewal. So you can do it with businesses and have those kinds of collaborations, but you can also have <coughs> remarkable results on a community level. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll take a break, but uh, if you don't know about SAMHSA, it's an incredible example. There's actually an article about it up here uh, that was just published recently. And um, if you're looking for more information, um, you can go to the website abundancecycle.com or check out some of the articles in, in these or the TED Talk. Uh, thank you. back in the 90s, early 90s, that while I got into it to start with and saw cost savings, it didn't stick with it, Jay. Um, and I'm curious just to know why. We got into a recession, and yeah. I don't know why it became less attractive, because it was all about saving money. Well, you know, and I mean, and you, you point to one of the other things, that there's, there's a lot of forces at play here, right? It's not, it's not clean. Um, so you know you can have the best of intentions and things can go wrong. You can have a, a turn a CEO turnover and that changes priorities. Um, you can have like your your death in a desperate cash situation, so maybe you don't have investment. I think one of the things, if I can build on that a little bit, sure. that you see that I that I think is so important is you really do need business and policy and activists. All it all needs to be going in the same direction, right? So it's not to say one is more important than the other. But so, for example, in Europe, you know, you have take back laws. So if you sell a computer or a television, right, as a company, you're taking that product back. You own it. You own it through its entire life cycle. And so what happens is, as a company, I suddenly I stop designing things so they can be thrown away. I start designing them, right, so I can bring them back in and harvest all the precious metals and everything out of them. And so, you know, you need those things working together to, to make sure that's going to happen. And so in some cases, the business case completely works. And in other places, you, need, you, know, you also need policy to, to keep that going. Yeah? Um, I, you just mentioned the word uh, policy. And I think that's one of the uh, main uh, restraints is a combination of inertia and uh, policy. Like, we need to uh, work as a group to make these things move forward, either publicly or privately or in a combination. But with uh, the um, current uh, power brokers um, having say over policy, and people, and admittedly, it's the public who has a real issue with urban planning and um, and making these decisions to build a bike a bike highway or all these uh, that we need to overcome, and it's a it's it's a it seems yeah. to be a difficult. Um, yeah, the policy environment is terrible, right? I, I, which you all know, right? And it, I mean, it's just atrocious. So I have less in, in the short term, less and less hope for policy and more and more hope for, you know, enterprise trying to do this. And, and I actually do, at College of the Atlantic, we have, uh, we have been sending students to all the climate negotiations. And, and I knew things were really changing when one of the professors, who was a big advocate of policy, he came back from one of the cops and he said, you know, this, like, the negotiations are just going nowhere. And he said, the only thing that I saw that was interesting was what the business community was doing. Mm -hmm. And in the business community, let me be clear, like, they're not doing this out of, it's not altruistic. They see opportunity here. But in a way, that's great, because that's where they're going to pour their energies. And I think, and, and, and the question mark in my mind is, you know, so if we're shifting towards this uh, abundance or a sustainable economy, you know, I don't, Will the shift happen fast enough? Is the you know twenty four thousand dollar question, which I don't have an answer to, but you know I think again you need all people pushing. But I the policy right now is terrible. So I I, mean, I more, see more and more students 
and others devoting towards you know enterprise, um, either for profit or non profit. Yeah. Yeah. Question that kind of does dovetails a little bit off that, and that is that you gave a lot of really interesting examples of, of different forms of transportation, um, and then also that that interesting um, island in, in um, Danish island that had been able to get you know essentially negative um, negative resource use. I'm curious, uh, have you seen many good examples of where some of that interesting technology has broken through and really kind of hit some of those critical economies of scale that go beyond kind of the, those small kind of pilot kind of efforts where well, it gets more mainstream? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I mentioned Zipcar. That's one great example. They were they were recently bought out, you know, for um, like five hundred million dollars. Um, Uber, and there's a lot of controversy around Uber, and I know that, but they're also using the sharing economy model. And if you look at how they're being valued, um, you know, they're being valued very far above what, you know, way above the whole transportation sector. Um, Airbnb is another example. The sharing, of, so the two huge opportunities here that I've seen are waste, like you said, and using waste as a resource, because as you may know, we're incredibly wasteful. Like something like along the lines of 99% of everything that's dug up, produced, made, is thrown out or buried within six months, right? So the opportunity there is staggering. The other is in the sharing economy, um, either peer-to-peer -peer or comp companies offering solutions. But, and there are lots of examples of, of those kinds of things, you know, now taking off that seven years ago didn't, you know, Airbnb seven years ago didn't exist. Now it's got more hotel rooms, than any major hotel chain in evaluation higher than all the legacy brands. Um, and, and they're using resources more efficient. Um, yeah. So uh, thank you for your presentation. I, I worry about the natural world side of things. So from your presentation, it seems to me that you could succeed if you got all the businesses to do what you want them to do. And we would still have impoverished the natural world in very significant ways. Because your only your tagline is is infra, is natural infrastructure, and your example was organic farming, and so this is very much about the parts of the natural world that are of use, direct use to businesses. So how do so what's the stop? What's the what's the insurance on this model in terms of the rest of the non-utilitarian? Well, let me let me give you an example. So this is a little utilitarian, but but it, it kind of gets that because. You know, the businesses understand as well that there's a whole set of ecosystem services out there that they're getting, you know, be it air or water or other things. Um, and so you have, a, you have a brewery in, I'm trying to remember if it's in I, Columbia, the, it's Bavaria Brewery, it's in, it's in South America, and they were having problems uh, with water. It's water, cool. yeah. And so they're a rather, water's a rather important part of beer, right? And so, and, and they had a couple of different options. One of which was you could have a plant that purifies all your water, that's you know millions of dollars to build, then you can get in the water as crappy as you want it and make it come out looking beautiful on the other end, theoretically. Um, but instead, what they did was they invested in, in preserving the environment around the headwaters and changing local farming practices. Um, and so it resulted in environmental preservation and which cleaned the water in and of itself just by having more land preserved and then you know, gave them the, what they were looking for. So part of it is getting people to see what are the different benefits. Um, now, I pursue that though. So if my interests were in spectacled bears, which live in that area where right. the watershed is, clean water doesn't need spectacled bears. In fact, it doesn't need a lot of the things that are living there. I could still get you clean water. Yeah. So that, if that's my concern, is that kind of a logic which is market driven might not produce the results that I'm after. Yeah, and I'm not advocating for solely market driven logic. What I'm saying is, you know, if you get if you have that ecosystem preserved, you're gonna have habitat for the speckled bears. Um, and yes, are there some things in nature that we shouldn't be valuing? Yeah, of course. Do you need preservation? Do you need conservation and land trust and land set aside and those things? Absolutely. But you know what, right now at the rate the economy is chewing everything up and spitting it out on the other side, um, I'm not sure that's gonna be enough. And so I would much rather be in a world where you have all the, it's, it's not to say do one and not do the other, right? So you still want that preservation and no, not everything is market-based, it's not all market-driven, you're not gonna put a value on every you know, banana slope. But you know, if you're not 
if the economy isn't functioning the other way, so it's looking at how do you value these things and how do you incorporate them into your business and make them more regenerative, the other, um, it's almost like tilting at windmills. If that, does, that, does that make sense? Sure. We can talk later, sure. Right. <laughs> yeah. On a, on a very large scale, what impact does the change in population get up or down have on the abundance cycle? Well, you know, I'm sort of bank, so there, there's been a lot of studies on this. So there's Jepson's paradox that says, like, the more efficient we get, the more stuff we end up using up. Um, the question then, if you go one step back from that, is, well, like, how are we picking our stuff that we're using, right? And so population, obviously, if more population, as more people grow, as, as there's more prosperity, you're going to have greater resource use. The question is, what are they using? And what the, the one piece that gives me a, some hope is the waste piece. And that, you know, there are companies now that are looking at uh, mining, um, you know, uh, landfills, and we have wasted so much that, you know, we, the planet could be supporting a whole lot more people if we were using resources, and, and, you know, much smarter. If everyone lives like we do in the U.S., I mean, the game, it's game over, right? You know, it's like you need five planets. So, so my hope is not only, and you can become efficient to a point, right? But what happens, the problem with efficiency is like we're running 60 miles an hour towards a cliff. Now we're running 30 because we're twice as efficient. Now we're running 15, so we're still heading for the cliff, we're just going slower. What you really have to do, and the reason the abundance cycle is closed, is you're looking at how do you create that closed loop production system so you don't need new inputs coming into it. And the waste that's out there, as you said, um, you know, that's the, the biggest area where you can be deriving new inputs to put those in. But you know, it's a question of will it get there in time. You know, the part of the question I had, it's kind of scary, and I know you're not a candidate, but does the government have a role in this? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you'd hope, right? Um, I think based on what, and what this gentleman said back here, I mean, the current policy situation is poison. Um, you know, people hear climate and they say, you're gonna kill the economy. Well, that's not really true, you know? And market-based carbon pricing, well, you know something, you know where that comes from? That comes from us. Like, we did that with acid rain when I was a kid. And it worked really well, and in fact, all the solutions were way cheaper than anyone thought they were going to be. But in the current policy arena, like, forget it. Um, and the, one of the reasons I would talk about abundance instead of sustainability is sustainability has really become associated with a scarcity mentality. Like, we have to preserve it for the future for the other people, so I got to take my shorter shower, shorter shower, versus saying like, no, wait, you can live more comfortably, um, you can have a better life, and you know, you, you can have the growth. Like, what you saw on SAMHSA, that was all economic growth, right? They put up turbines, they had district heating plants installed, they had local jobs that were produced, and in turn, and they were also, by the way, you know, building a local economy, and they got carbon totally out of their system. And now they're looking at um, how they eliminate all fossil fuels off the island entirely, um, because they're still bringing in some, but they're a net carbon producer, or they're, yeah, they're net carbon negative. So now the next step on this is, how do you, you know, reduce, get rid of all fossil fuels so you're not using those inputs? And that's the question, going back to the population growth, right? How do you change what we're putting into it so we get something better out on the other side? Um, yeah, Jess? So um, when I think about the abundance cycle, it, it seems like it applies in a lot, of, on a, a lot of different levels of the work that we do, and I'm sort of checking this with you um, for your reaction. So we can do it, I can do it in the office. With Doreen, we can sit down and we can talk about, okay, so we recycle this with paper, we throw this stuff away, maybe we should, you know, change some of our practices. And then I can think about it with our board and our organizations and think about how, you know, if we think about what we're trying to do, either in, as the individual groups with the missions that they have or as a collaboration. But then I think we can also take it a little bit at a broader sense around the community um, issues. And that's sort of where land conservation as a movement is, is sort of trying to go, is thinking about um, our role as larger community players and, and addressing larger community needs. So it may be a way to kind of turn our conversation to how, um, how can we better sort of support these abundant opportunities that we have. Is that yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And so um, I did a presentation a while ago for Gross Farm Maine, 
And looking at this, the whole abundance cycle model can actually be reconfigured. So instead of looking at it like an enterprise, you can look at the community, right? And because the community has the same things happening, and like stuff is coming in, things are being produced, right? You're distributing uh, goods and services out in the community, and so yeah, you can take it and say and go from just what am I doing here to how do we engage with the broader community and how do we use um, conservation and ecology to help improve lives for for everybody. And if you look at all the sustainable business stuff, it's all out, it's all based on ecology. Like that's where it's coming from. This didn't come from the business community. Right? This is coming from people, you know, who have this mindset of folks sitting in this room saying, wow, well, we can look for new opportunities and, and figure out different ways of doing things. Um, and you need the mind the mindset that's sitting in this room, you need to get that out there to help other people come around and you need to think about how do you do that in a way so when we engage with the community, the community also sees it as a positive, not as someone just saying, you need to just do this better, you, this is the right thing to do, right? Um, which it may very well be the right thing to do and you might get the solution you want, but let's try and get everybody on board with us. Um, so you can have, you know, it'll just, it'll just make it less of a headache, essentially. So yeah, abso absolutely. So, yeah. I was, I, I've been down at a conference, like, it was a three day conference in New Haven, co sponsored by the School of Forestry and the Business School at Yale. Um, it was on this very topic. And there were, you know, parallel workshops for three days of multi tracks in every sector from energy and water and waste and agriculture. And, you know, it was, and each one of them was, was, was business driven, you know, businesses that are working in all of these sectors on all of these principles. And <clears throat> it was really one of the most hopeful um, experiences I've had in, in years to kind of come away and, and, and sort of feel like, holy cow, you know, we are living in these sort of parallel universes where we think that the political debate is really where we are and that there's all this resistance to these ideas and that we're so polarized and that we're never going to, you know, move from step a, you know a to b and then there's this business reality you know the corporate reality and these were not just you know the ubers and the whole foods of the world these right. were ge and british petroleum and you know like companies that are so far down the road in thinking about sustainability to use the hackneyed term but in a way that makes the bottom line better and, you know, so I, I really, I just, you know, I kind of left feeling like, wow, you know, maybe there is hope. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, and, and I mean, that's the, that, that's the, you sort of go between hope and despair, right? Right, And absolutely. so, you, you know, on the one hand, you see all the problems out there, and it's easy to say, like, oh, and I deal with this with students all the time. They come in, like, there's no hope. What am I doing here? Like, I, I go into every class, and everyone tells me how crappy the world is. Like, it just sucks. <laughs> um, and then you turn around on the other side, and you say, wow, wait a minute, there's amazing things going on out there. And I see this with students starting enterprises. I've given the, this talk based around all kinds of different industries. Industries I would have never, like the fashion industry, that I would have never have imagined is doing stuff. And there's amazing things happening out there in every sector. Um, and, and you can get, you know, there's, there's a company called Evocative Design that's making packaging out of, packaging out of mycelium. Right, so it's a biodegradable packaging they're growing basically out of out of mushrooms. There's GE is doing incredible stuff. Um, they have a whole their eco imagination, their eco imagination division, uh, which is all about you know efficiency, uh, solar, renewable energy. That division of GE is a Fortune 150 company. So that little piece of GE is 100, one of the 150 largest companies on you know on the planet. So I mean there is you're right. I mean there is incredible stuff, but you gotta. So you have to look for it, and you know what? These people, the people who are doing this stuff, they want to engage, and they want to engage not in a way that's, hey, we wrote you a check, like that's because that's the sort of old model, this corporate social responsibility where I'm a good citizen. Look, I wrote a check, you know, and there. I mean, which is great, right? Don't get me wrong. I'm sure everyone here wouldn't mind another check, but um, people are also looking for a more meaningful engagement that can help them figure out how do you navigate these waters, how do you think about this stuff. Because because they haven't been spending the time doing that because they're focused on running the enterprise and so that's the different perspective that people here can bring and you know perspective what perspective guides everything else 
The questions you're asking and the perspective you have guides the opportunities you see, right? And so, so that is one of the key things that they're looking for is help figuring out what is a different way to look at this um, in a way that, that's accretive, if that makes sense. So yeah, that, I mean, the example you said, it's, I, I'm always, I've been really amazed by, by what's out there. Just to follow on to it, though, I think I, I think there's a lack of awareness, you know, that these stories aren't being told, but that we still think that we live in this hopeless sort of world. I, I, you know, I'm not a Pollyanna about it, but I just feel like we hear so much about the political controversy and clash of ideology and paralysis that we don't hear, you know, that there really is yeah. reason to... Well, in one place, actually, there's a, a new network of journalists that are working on talk, telling stories of people who have come up with solutions. And so there's a whole solutions journalism network mm -hmm. that's out there. And, and these are not, you know, these are people who are writing for the New York Times and other really reputable publications. And they're telling stories of things, positive things that are happening all over the world. Precisely because what you're saying is you don't, all you hear about is gloom and doom, usually. Yeah. You, you, add, you said what I was just thinking, which is, it's the media, yeah. which is pervasively telling us about disaster. Yeah, and, and there are places, other websites, I mean, like Triple Pundit, Green Biz, um, you know, the, uh, the Carbon War Room. I mean, there's really, there are places you can get this information. But again, you know, you, uh, you, if you're working in an area long enough, you tend to get siloed in, mm -hmm. right, to thinking about things a certain way and getting information from a certain place. So you, you got to get out there and, and, and explore. Yeah, I think this is this the last last question. All right. Okay. It's, it's a comment. Uh, I, I didn't see medicine mm. introduced at all in an extending life cycle. Um, where where does that fit into your picture? I mean, it, it absolutely fits in there. Um, you know, if this was, you know, there's just the problem is there's too much to talk about. I have a whole other. T if you want to stay, I got a whole other talk that I just I deleted <laughs> to come here. You know, to to talk about this. Um, but all around abundance, but it absolutely fits in. And what, you know, so the, and there's amazing things happening now, especially around telemedicine and bringing medical care. Um, and, and particularly the, the tactic they're oftentimes using is that unbundling, right? They're finding out what are the critical care pieces that we really need that will make a difference and then focusing those in. Um, if you go to the Abundance Cycle website, you'll see examples from the medical industry. I mean, there, there really are examples from, from all over. The other thing I should say is, the examples are from little teeny tiny startups to you know great big giant corporations to for profit and non profit. Mm -hmm. Right. So I don't really I don't really differentiate between those. And what's the website? Uh, abundancecycle.com. Thank you. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's this one right here. Right, okay. Yeah. Um, great. Well thank you all so much. <laughs>